Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. Let's take a moment now to reflect on what that means, but first prepare our hearts in prayer. Please bow your heads with me this time. Lord, we thank you that you have declared you are the good shepherd and that you have called us your sheep, your sheep who you tenderly look after, who you comfort, who are you, who, with whom you are with always. Lord, we pray that today as we reflect on your statement that you are the good shepherd, that we would consider just what a joy it is to be your sheep. That as we think about being your sheep, that we would seek each day to be those who represent you as our good shepherd in what we say and what we do. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Probably besides the crucifixion, the image of Jesus as the good shepherd is the most impactful image that Christians have. Think about for yourselves just a moment. When you hear that Jesus is the good shepherd, what image comes to your mind? Do you picture maybe like the picture that's in the bottom of the bulletin where Jesus is carrying a sheep on his shoulders? Or, or what comes to your mind when you imagine Jesus saying, I am the good shepherd? Now, just last week, we looked at the fact that he said, I am the door, but, but, and, and that talked about that way of eternal life. But the good shepherd captures a whole nother image for us today. The good shepherd talks about our day-to-day -day lives with him. It's interesting that we still appreciate this image because I don't know about you, but I have my only experience really with farms is to actually go to the petting zoos that Mr. Mark was talking about a minute ago. How many of you have actually been on a running farm, working farm where there are sheep? All right, that's more than I expected, especially here in Manhattan Beach. But, uh, but honestly, how many of you, even if you've never been on a farm, appreciate the image of Jesus the Good Shepherd? Let's go ahead and hands up again. Yeah. So that's a lot more folks than actually have ever been on a farm. And why do you think this is? Why do you think that this image is so impactful, that, that it speaks to children who are uh, just little children, who speaks to adults, who, to, it speaks to people who are, uh, who, who are even on their deathbed? Why do you think this image is so important? When we think about the, the statement Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, it's a reminder that Jesus cares for our day-to-day -day lives. Not only does he care for our spiritual well-being, I am the door, he is the way to eternal life, but he cares for your day-to-day -day lives as well. He cares about what is happening. All-powerful, all-knowing God cares about you. He cares about you and loves you. And I think that is why that message that Jesus is the good shepherd speaks to each of us so profoundly. Because when you think about it, it may seem mundane. It may even seem pedantic in, in our churches. But think for just a moment about those who are outside of the Christian community. Those who worship other gods. Those who have no other gods. They don't have a God who cares deeply for them. The Christian religion alone, our Christian faith alone, speaks of a God who cares deeply for each of his sheep. Enough to know them by name. Have you thought about that? that God knows you by name. Out of the seven billion approximately people on the earth right now, not to mention the ones who have gone before, the ones who are yet to come, God knows you by name. It's pretty powerful when you stop to think about it. This image of Jesus as the good shepherd reminds us of, a, of a, several things. It reminds us, first of all, of the fact that, that, that our day, each day is in his hands. That while we may not always know what the future holds, God does. He reminds us that we have a God who has laid down his life for the sheep, for his sheep, that he cares for us, that he has made a way for us. It reminds us that he looks after us day to day. And I think of no better way to talk about the good shepherd and the way he cares for us day by day than Psalm chapter 23. Many of you, again, know Psalm 23. I've read it at, on, at countless bedsides. I've... Uh, just about every funeral memorial service I've conducted, Psalm 23 shows up in some way because it talks about that tender care of our shepherd. And as we go to Psalm 23 today instead of John chapter 10, I want to just give you a little bit of context. 
Context for what was happening in David's life. David, we believe, is the author of several of the Psalms right around there. In fact, I encourage you to read 22 right before that. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Psalm chapter 24, which follows it. And, and do, please do that after church today. But, but we're going to stop in Psalm 23. And David wrote Psalm 23, not from the comfort of his palace in Jerusalem. He didn't write Psalm 23 as he looked out over Jerusalem and thought, wow, God, look at all you have done for me. David wrote it on the run. Now, he was not on the run from Saul. In fact, at this point, Saul had already uh, gone, uh, you know, passed away. But uh, instead, David was on the run from his own son. He was on the run from his son Absalom. Now, you may not remember history, but David had approximately 19 sons That's what the Hebrew Bible tells us. At least those are the names that are listed, not to mention daughters. And one of his sons, Absalom, looked at the beautiful kingdom of Jerusalem that God had given to David, and he said, wow, I want a piece of the pie. Not surprising. Look at the world we live in today. Things don't change very much. In fact, actually, he wanted the entire pie. So he brought up a military coup against his dad, and David, of course, not wanting to die, makes a run, and he goes out into the wilderness. And from that wilderness, he writes the words of Psalm chapter 23. From the wilderness of his life, from the wilderness of his family, from the struggles, he writes Psalm chapter 23. And I'd like you to join me as we go there now and read about our good shepherd. And we're going to go to page 539. If you have it memorized, I, I suppose you don't have to turn there. Um, if you, we are reading the NIV, so I apologize to, for those of you who have the King James memorized, uh, because I suspect that's what half of you do have. But uh, we are going to go to Psalm 23, and we're going to look at the NIV version. And we're going to look at page 539 in those red Bibles. If you have your own Bible, basically flip the Bible open, and it kind of comes to Psalm naturally. NIV translation, Psalm chapter 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And we're going to stop there. We'll we'll pick up, I promise, in four and five. I know it's hard to stop there, isn't it? You want to keep going. Uh, But honestly, I want to stop there because we see something immediately. Remember, what did Jesus say? He said, I am the good shepherd. And remember, that is code word for Yahweh. Well, I want you to notice the very first word David uses there. Well, the second word, but in the Hebrew, it's the first word. The Lord. And when you notice, if you look at the, actually look at the text, did you notice that it's all in capital letters? Did anybody else notice that? Yeah? Well, when it's small caps like that, O-R-D, that is an indication to us that that is when, God, when God's divine name is being used. That is an indication that Yahweh is being used, or ego eimi in the Greek. And so this is Jesus himself. When he says, I am the good shepherd, he is pointing his people, his, the people, his original hearers, right back to this text. He is reminding them who he is, who he is as God, the Lord, the Yahweh. And so he starts off with that very important phrase. And then to our minds, the immediate image that comes to mind, of course, is those green pastures to which he leads us. The promise that he cares not only for our spiritual lives, but our physical lives as well. The promise that he cares about what we have not only to eat and drink, but uh, the houses we live in, the vehicles we drive. Now, when you think about those green pastures, what image comes to your mind? Because I think a lot of times uh, we, we maybe get a little bit of a, our image is a little bit off. Because I suspect for many of you, if you're like me at least for a long time, what comes to mind are the rolling hills of Ireland. And you picture these beautiful green, lush hills. Is that what comes to anybody else's mind? Yeah? Well, okay, a few of you. Well, those are not the hills, maybe a few of them, but of the Middle East. In fact, if you go to the hills of the Middle East, what you find instead is patchy grass, much more like the Imperial Valley where I ministered before, where you see grass here and there, but it is not consistent. Instead, what you see in the Middle East are rocky crags and hills where there's not a lot. And this is important, though. This is not just a little uh, rabbit trail or sheep trail. This is actually important because it reminds us, when we say that the Lord is the shepherd and he leads us to green pastures, that he cares for our day-to-day needs and gives us what we need. He gives us what we need. Now, if you have that image of the beautiful Irish hills and huge amounts of grass, it suggests a place of abundance, doesn't it? A place where food's never going to run out. A sheep can go in circles for hours and never, uh, never finish eating grass. 
That's not the image that Jesus wants us to have, though. He wants us to have an image of trust in him, that we need him on a daily basis. The good shepherd would lead his sheep to different places of grass in the Middle East. When his sheep would consume the grass that was there, they weren't smart enough. Mr. Mark was right. They were not smart enough to find that grass on their own. So the good shepherd would lead them day by day. Is this to say that God doesn't provide for us abundantly? Absolutely not. God provides for each of us richly, more than we can imagine. But that image of, of, of grass here and there that reminds us that we need to follow him, trust in him, follow his paths. Follow his paths as he leads us to those quiet waters. And I love this image of quiet water because it's not really, we're not really meant to imagine drinking and drinking a bunch of water, but instead we're meant to think about the quietness. How many of you have this week said, I am too busy? You don't have to raise your hand on that one. I am too busy. It's become the mantra of our world. It's become the repeated phrase. We find something to fill every hour of every day, of every second. If we don't have something on the weekend, we make something to do on the weekend. And we say, I'm too busy. I'm too busy for this. I'm too busy for that. Maybe when I'm dead, I'll have time. God says, no. You need daily Sabbath rest with me. You need daily time to take time with the Lord amongst his quiet waters where he refills you, refreshes you. Not just Sunday morning time to be refreshed in his word, to be refreshed in his truths, but you need day-to-day time of, of communion with him, prayer with him, day-to-day time refreshed by his holy word. You need Sabbath rest. And this is not just a biblical concept, but many of you probably have read the studies that stress is literally killing people. Stress is literally causing physical death in people. We need that day-to-day reprieve. God created us for that rest with him. Not once a week, not twice a week, but every day to take time to rest in him. And resting in him, not only taking time in prayer, but to read his word. Notice, uh, the, right as we finished up a moment ago, he guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now again, I need you to take you back over to the Middle East so, so that we don't picture our, our modern day and age. When you picture, the, picture the, where the sheep were, they were along these rocky crags. They were along dangerous places, but they trusted the shepherd and followed his voice. They trusted the shepherd and followed him so that he could protect them. God gives us his word to protect us from the attacks of this life. God gives us his word to lead us so that we don't fall into the traps of the devil, sin, our own sinful selves. He gives us his word so that we might remain safe. Now I want to keep going in this Psalm chapter 23, and I want to just read the next couple. We'll come to six, I promise, in a moment. I think that's most people's favorite verse, maybe not. But let's go back to Psalm chapter 23, and if you lost your page, it's 539. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. (laughs) Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's not verse 6 that most people need to hear so often. Maybe it's that verse 4. Because it seems like so often this is why people desire this verse read as they're, is they're laying there in pain in a hospital bed. They need to know that they have a God who in the darkest hours of their lives is with them. They need to know that they have a God who cares deeply for them. And even as they face the darkness of this world, the divorces of this world, the family problems of this world, the loss of a job of this world, they need to know that they have a God who still cares for them. And I think verse 4 speaks right to that truth. Even though we walk through those valleys where we feel hopeless and worthless, God says, you are my little lamb. Say it with me. I am Jesus' little lamb. I am Jesus' little lamb. Jesus' little lamb who he cares for, who he loves, 
who he nurtures, who he walks through this time. And maybe you've read those verses, that verse 5, and you said, well, what is he talking about? Preparing a table in the presence of my enemies and my cup running over and being anointed in my head with oil. This is a promise that he gives us as we go through those times of trial. A promise to each of us that even in the midst of the trial, he's going to bring us through to something greater. Even as we face those trials, the promise that, no, it may not be an earthly, uh, an earthly blessing, but he is going to bless us in a trusting relationship with him. For as you go through, and you all who have been through trials, everybody here, you know that when you go through a trial and you come out the other side, you see where God led you through, where God was with you. And it's so important that we see that God is the one who leads us. Because we talk about the rod and the staff of our God. Now, I think sometimes, again, you know, fixing an image here, sometimes, unfortunately, we have the image of the bad shepherd when we think about the rod and the staff. And what does the bad shepherd do? A bad shepherd gets behind his sheep, and when they don't do what they're supposed to do, you know what he does? Whack! The rod and the staff is meant to keep those sheep in line, to push them, to challenge them. Oh, you sheep, you got into the bush again? Whack! That's not the image of the good shepherd. Do you know in the Middle East to this day, good, sh- good shepherds do not go, are not behind their sheep, but they are in front of their sheep. And do you know how they lead their sheep? Not with the rod, we're yanking them, or not with the staff, beating them. They sing to their sheep. Now that was not a joke, actually. They actually sing to their sheep, and the sheep get to know, as Jesus said, their voice. The sheep get to know the song that the shepherd sings to them. Or, or even some, some shepherds use a flute. And it leads the sheep. And they follow because they know the voice. And they've learned to trust that shepherd. And if this is true of good shepherds in the Middle East to this day, imagine how much truer it is for our good shepherd, Jesus Christ, who says, my sheep know my voice. When we begin to trust the Lord, when we begin to follow him in our day-to-day lives, we begin to hear his voice and we know that's a voice I can trust because I know that's a voice that's going to lead me to a place where I can find rest. That's a voice that's going to lead me where I can feed and, 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 and be filled again. That's a voice that will lead me and I won't fall off, and, off of the side of a, a cliff. That's a voice that leads me to a place of peace. The rod and the staff are meant for protection. The reason the shepherd carries the rod and the staff It's because, let's face it, lions and tigers and bears, oh my, they attack the sheep. And they protected them. Well, sin, death, and the devil, oh my, attack each of us. And Jesus carries his rod and his staff to protect us. Not to enforce, not to challenge, but to protect us. Why does he carry the rod and staff? To make sure his sheep are safe. So that we might be with him forever. Let's read the last verse together. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That last verse, again, is such an important verse because David sums up his spirit of trust. He knows that he's in a dark place right now with his family as Absalom is literally pursuing his life. He knows that he's in a place right now where where he may or may not return to Jerusalem but he trusts in God. And this is a statement, I, and I want you to notice, that's not only surely goodness and mercy, this is not a promise just about what is to come, eternal life with Jesus Christ as a Savior. This is a, tr- a statement of trust for today, for each day to come. He knows that no matter what happens, he is in the hands of the good shepherd. When Jesus declares, I am the good shepherd, he wants us to know that he is with us always, that he cares for us spiritually, he cares for us physically. He is the one who leads us and protects us. He is the one who will one day lead us to be home forever with him. The only question I have left is, is he your good shepherd? Is he your good shepherd? Is he the one that you follow every single day? Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for you have declared to us that you are the good shepherd who cares for us each and every day. You have not promised that our lives would be easy, that our lives would not be without the difficulties. 
In fact, we know that so often our lives are filled with places that are, are dark. We know that we, we go through days where we struggle with our worth. We struggle with our identity. We struggle with our purpose. Help us each day, though, to know the truth that you have said, that you are the good shepherd. Help us to know the truth and, and to, to, to have faith in you, that you are the one who cares deeply for your sheep, that not only do you care, but you love your sheep. You love each one of us enough to know each of us by name. Lord, help us to know you. Help us to trust you, to follow you. Help us to listen for your voice, even in the times when it is still and small and quiet. Help us to listen as it speaks to our hearts and our lives, as, as you seek to guide us, so that we might know your protection and your peace. Forgive us, O oh Lord, for those times when we wander off with other shepherds, shepherds who seem to, see, to offer us something better. We know that those shepherds only lead to death, but for you are the only good shepherd. Lord, lead us to follow you, to follow you, follow your word, to know that you will provide for us abundantly, to know that you will give us our Sabbath rest, and that one day you shall lead us to be at rest with you forever. We thank you, Lord, for you are our good shepherd. As your sheep we pray. Amen.